Good evening. I'm Gayatri Uppal, and I work as Associate Director Grants at the Shegil Sundaram Arts Foundation. It is a pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of the Shegil Sundaram Arts Foundation, or SSAF, to this evening's event, a panel discussion on the fifth wall, a digital archive on SSAF's co-founder and managing trustee, Navina Sundaram's work during her career of 40 years in public television in Germany. The archive was created by Mel Kroger and Marike Bernien and was launched last year in September. As part of this event, online screenings of a selection of Navina Sundaram's documentaries and TV reports for NDR will be available to view until 31st January on SSAF's website, ssaf.in. To briefly introduce SSAF, it was established in 2016 with the mandate to carry forward the legacy of scholar and photographer, Omrao Singh Shergil, his daughter and a pioneering figure of modern Indian art, Amrita Shergil, and her nephew and niece, artist Vivan Sundaram, and filmmaker and television journalist, Navina Sundaram. Since its inception, the foundation's mandate has been cultural practice that deal with historical based on secular principles and freedom of expression. SSAF is committed to advancing creative independence and supporting alternative and heterodox practices. And I encourage you to visit our website, ssaf.in, to learn more about our programs. This, evening, this evening's panel discussion is being moderated by Madhushri Datta, a filmmaker and cultural producer living in Mumbai. She was executive director of Majlis, a cultural center, Mumbai, from 1998 to 2016, an artistic director of the Academy of the Arts of the World in Cologne, Germany, from 2018 to 2021. Her nonfiction films address issues of citizenry, identity, memory practices, urban cultures, and public cultures. Madhushri Datta has initiated several analog and digital archive projects in India and Germany. She has been awarded nationally and internationally for her films, activism, and arts management. A few technical points about this evening's event. We request you to keep your audio and video off and would also like to inform you that this session is being recorded. The presentations and discussion will be for one hour and 45 minutes, and there will be a Q&A to conclude. We request you to type your questions or comments in the chat box during as well as after the, uh, after the discussion, which Madhushri will be taking as they come in. Uh, it is now my pleasure to hand over to Madhushri to introduce the panelists and to commence the program. Over to Madhushri. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the virtual event that is multilocational in many ways than one. Good evening, good afternoon, maybe also good morning, depending on where you are joining us from. We have panelists who are joining us from two different time zones. Virtual events have made us measure the distances by the time zone. As we go live on the virtual space, we become more alert about the position of the daylight at the other end. The homogenization of the screen presence can only be distinguished by the daylight or the absence of it. But I think the concept of times as different iterations will come back again and again through this evening's deliberation. We have a protagonist who have always been multi-locational, being in different locations across the globe, engaging with different ground realities while using her own well-honed tool, her political perspective and post-colonial humor. So can we um, see a glimpses of our protagonist uh, sure. play from here to here? Sure, yes. It is fitting that at this solemn moment, we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people. Nero, no? And to the service of India, India means the service, service 
Of the million Sabah. Also ich bin ein Nehru-Kind, ne? Da bin ich in ja, Nehru's Vision aufgewachsen in Indien. Das war ganz großartig, das säkulare so Indien. Ne? Ja. So, jetzt wollte ich dir zeigen, wie die Anfänge waren. Und zwar war das in dem Studio Neu Delhi für die Ansage, die ich gemacht hatte, für den Korrespondenten, für eine Reihe asiatischer Miniaturen. Und das fing immer so an. Hinter dem, das war der, ähm, also der Serientitel, Asiatische Miniaturen. And now, wait. Also, nee, oh Gott, das ist ja endlos. Also das sind auch Bilder von, von Indien, ne? wie man sich das vorstellt. Das ist im Jahre 2. 61 oder 62, glaube ich. So. Studio Neu Delhi. Ah, und jetzt kommt es. Das bin ich. Namaste. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren in Deutschland. Hier meldet sich Navina Sundaram aus dem Fernsehstudio des Norddeutschen Rundfunks in Indien. Also das hinter dem Fächer, das ist nicht meine Idee. Da war meine erste Begegnung mit dem deutschen Fernsehen. Und das heißt, über die Zeit da, 62, so wurde Asien auch präsentiert. Es äh, bediente auch ein, ein Klischee. Ne? Dann die späteren Sachen, das waren meine, also wie man sich präsentiert. Ne? Wie alle Inder bin ich stolz auf die außenpolitischen Erfolge meines Landes. So. Also hier ist es ganz bewusst auf Indisch. Ne? Da, weil ich einen Film gemacht habe, über 25 Jahre indische Unabhängigkeit, habe ich mich auch in Ansari präsentiert, das bewusst auch einge eingesetzt als Strategie, ne? wegen der Authentizität. Schwedischen Dynamitproduzenten und Pazifisten Alfred Nobel fängt an, sauer zu werden. Der Nobelfriedenspreis 1973 geht an den US-Außenminister Henry Kissinger, und an den Mitglied des nordvietnamesischen Politbüros Le Docteur. Guten Abend. Seit fast einem halben Jahrhundert sind die herrschenden Theorien und Methoden darüber, wie ganze Nationen ihrer Armut entrinnen können, bestimmt durch vier Schlagworte. Ich begrüße Sie beim Weltspiegel. Das Ende des Sowjetkommunismus bringt auch das Ende der Sowjetunion. Sehr geehrte Herren, es ist ein Skandal, dass diese Sendung von einer Ausländerin moderiert wird. Es ist weiter ein trauriges Zeichen, dass sich bei euch kein Mann findet, der das macht. Diese Dame soll doch in ihr Kaffernland gehen. Es war interessant. Immer war diese Debatte darüber, wenn ich das präsentierte, gab es ein Problem weil ich zu sehen war. Zuerst war es die Sprache, dann ist es die Nähe, dann ist es die Ferne, dann ist es, es ist immer irgendetwas. Wo bleiben die Migranten? In den Medien. Well, that is Navina Sundaram. Her political perspective and postcolonial humor. The perspective that belongs to the Indian who had grown up in the early decades after independence the Nehruvian child, as she puts it. And then presenting it to an essentially German audience in the period of 70s to 90s, between the end of Cold War and the collapse of the Berlin Wall. So already we have three layers that are sort of tactile and within our life memory range, the post-Cold War Europe, post-colonial South Asia, and also other parts of the colonized world. Uh, I must uh, put a disclaimer here. I'm using the word um, post-colonial and post-Cold War in a very generic sense and not getting into, uh, nuan getting into the nuances of it. And then being a non-native German speaker, non-native German speaker is a very German way of uh, putting people who speak as good German as any native German uh, would be, uh, for example, Navina Sundaram, you just heard her speaking. 
uh, but they put they make it very clear that who is native and who is not native. Being an outsider, Auslander, being a woman who was to appear regularly on the crucial public space of national television and influence the political opinion. All these layers then become conscious strategies to placing the dry facts of the news within a frame that refers to more sustenance than the news itself. The persona, the clothing, the choice of words in the voiceover, accents, background image, and so on. A performance of the news live and layered in the pre-internet era. So Navina Sundaram, born in 1945, grew up and studied in New Delhi. Uh, she worked as editor and reporter in the current affairs department, foreign correspondent, and anchor woman at North German uh, Broadcasting, North Deutscher Rundfunk, NDR. Her research and reporters on international affairs and political histories reflect her vantage position at the crossroads of critical post-colonial voices emerging from the global south and the post-war reorganization of Western Europe, especially Germany. Navina, as Gayatri already told you, is co-founder and managing trustee of SSAF, Shergil Sundaram Out Art Foundation in Delhi, the host of this event. Though political news is her mainstay, she has also made films on other subjects, mainly on cultural projects and art initiatives. I remember meeting her for the first time in 1989 at Kasoli Art Center when she was filming a feminist theater workshop and I was trying my hands in theater apprenticeship. It might not be far-fetched to say that the almost accidental meeting with Navina Sundaram could be one of the reasons of my interest in documentary culture. The second protagonist of this event is The Fifth Wall, an archive that is attempting to frame the works and also locate Navina Sundaram within the media history. With an understanding or um, awareness that the live reportings, while seen after decades, might come alive again to provoke different readings as the present, quote unquote, present keeps entering into and evolving different political times. That means the many lives of not so current affairs. The fifth wall curated by Marla Kroger and Maraika Bremen is produced by Pong, a prolific production platform in Berlin that ranges between different genres of documentary and narrative productions. And so I would like to place this endeavor, that is the fifth wall, exactly where Pong is between documentary and narrative. Another way of looking at it could be that it is between time zones, not in the sense of daylight, but as eras. The fifth wall collated the news and documentary pieces that are directly related to the 70s and 90s, got them annotated by the practitioners of the 2020s, and then making both the works, the past news and the present readings as entries in the archive. So it is not only collating and cataloging, but already embedded is one practice of reading the archive with the hope of encouraging different readings in the future. So the title, The Fifth Wall, though actually it is a direct quotation from one of Navina's letter to her parents about Vietnam War in 1969, refers to the exercise to draw sustenance from diverse sources in order to engage with the phenomenon, the German television news in the 70s, in this case, something more to extrapolate, to induce. And that is precisely the reason why we decided to present the archive from the SSA platform to a predominantly Indian audience. Though at the moment the archive is, um, 
mostly in German, only a part of it has been uh, subtitled in English, especially for, uh, this, uh, for this occasion. But um, the organizers are hoping to uh, get the entire English version of the archive up uh, within a few months. But the archive was launched only a few months ago uh, when I was still living in Germany. Uh, I was located within a German cultural institution. The fifth wall then at the first look appeared to be a German media history with a strong critique on the migration policy. In Germany, one of the central points of the endeavor is another perspective of migration and the contribution of the migrants in the making of contemporary Europe. But as this event takes place now, today, I'm already back in India and engaging with the archive now from here, it seems to be about an assertion of reversed lens, sharp opposite of colonial anthropology also a confident articulation of the right to move, to squat, to narrativize, and to critique. These are briefly the issues that we shall attend to this evening. Political news, documentary languages, locations of the author in documentaries, media history, archival footage, archival architecture, revisiting history, colonial, post-colonial, and off-colonial legacies. So without uh, taking any more time, I shall introduce the uh, panelists of the evening. Uh, Marla Kroger, my longtime friend and collaborator in numerous projects across Berlin and Mumbai. She's joining us from Berlin this evening. She's a novelist, screenwriter, and film producer. Together with filmmaker Philip Schiffner, she has been making documentary feature films since 2007. In her novels, Kroger combines historical research, personal history, and political analysis with the elements of crime literature. Marla's latest novel, The Expert, has just received the best German crime fiction prize for 2021. Congratulations, Marla. As curator of the transnational cultural project, import export cultural transfer between India and Germany, Austria in 2005, a program that I was also involved with, she began a long term collaboration with the filmmaker and television journalist Navina Sundara. Our second panelist is Deepa Dhanraj, joining from Bangalore. A longtime friend and associate of Davina Sundaram is a researcher, writer, and documentary filmmaker. She was one of the founding members of Yugantar, a feminist film collective that made films centering the political organizing of women, domestic, and factory workers. She's a founding member of Oral History Association of India, co-authored with K. Lalita of Rapture, Loss, and Living, Minority women speak about post-conflict life, a collection of oral narratives of Muslim women survivors of sectarian violence. Dhanraj is currently working on an audiovisual archive of the anti-caste students movement that arose in 2016 after the suicide of the Dalit research scholar Rohit Bhemula. Then Shashi Kumar, joining us from Madras, is a journalist, filmmaker, and media entrepreneur. He founded and chairs the Media Department, Media Development Foundation, which administers the Asian College of Journalism. He was among the earliest newscaster in English on India's public television, national television, Doordarshan and has anchored and produced numerous shows, documentaries, and features for Doordarshan. In 1992, he launched Asianet, India's first satellite TV channel in a regional language, Malayalam, and the first statewide cable TV networks in Kerala. In 2004, he scripted and directed Kaya Taran, 
a film based on the 1984 anti-Sikh riots and the 2002 Gujarat program. Well, Shashi is one such person who does not, like many of us, wait for the state initiatives to counter the market, nor does he endlessly lament the invasion of right doing, invasion of the right doing and the market in our public life. His scale is not at the level of initiatives or centers or um, alternatives. He imagines at the level of university and television ne network. He's not a fragile alternative, but robust opposition. Holker Pattenburg, joining us from Zurich, is a professor of film studies at the University of Zurich. He has published widely on assistic film and video practices, experimental cinema, and contemporary moving images installations. His books in English include Faruqi Godad, Film as Theory, 2015, Cinematog Cinematographic Objects, Things and Operations, 2015, as editor, Screen Dynamics, Mapping the Borders of Cinema, 2012, as co-editor. In 2015, he co-founded the Harun Faruqi Institute, a platform to engage with Faruqi's practice and initiate projects that explore contemporary media and image cultures, where he is currently involved in a research project around Skip Norman's life and work. Harun Faruqi was also a friend and contemporary of Navina. I remember um, first time meeting Harun Faruqi only through uh, Navina, and his engagement with public and non-public television is already much talked about. So without taking any uh, more time, I shall request Marla Kroger, uh, the uh, curator, designer, uh, author, of, um, editor uh, of, the, of the fifth wall to take us on a brief walkthrough of the archive. Marla. Okay, thanks, Madhu. Thanks for the, your introduction. Actually, I don't know where to start now because you said already a lot, uh, which I actually thought I have to say. So I make it short and take you uh, into the fifth wall. But before, let me just resume um, that uh, Navina Sundaram in 1963 was asked to moderate the broadcast series Asian Miniatures, what, which you just saw, the one with a fan, by uh, um, German correspondent Hans Walter Berg, produced at the German television studio in New Delhi and it was just newly established that studio at the time and um, as a result she was invited to complete a two years training program as a television journalist at the northern television ch channel NDR in Hamburg. So there she continued to work uh, mostly permanently and most of the time permanently employed for over 30 years. And as a filmmaker, commissioning editor and moderator, she worked for programs like Weltspiegel, which is translated World Mirror, Gesichter Asiens, Faces of Asia, Panorama, and Extra 3, which is three special, among others. <clears throat> In between, she always uh, also was uh, the ARD correspondent and head of the South Asia television studio in New Delhi. During her time at NDR, she produced numerous documentaries, reports, and adaptations. And after leaving the NDR in 2004, Navina <clears throat> continued um, um, to work as an independent director of documentaries and author of numerous texts and lectures. So what I do now, I um, try to share my screen and I take you to the archive itself. Let's see if it works. Okay, do you see my screen now? Somebody, thumb yeah, okay, super. That is <laughs> already a good sign. So um, if we enter the fifth wall, we um, reach exactly here. You see, it starts with a pan and I just switch to full screen. Um, the fifth wall, die fünfte Wand, Navina Sundaram, and then the subtitle translated an insider's outside view or an outsider's inside view. <clears throat> the archive, the fifth wall, brings together films, reports, moderations by Navina Sundaram from her work for television and thus is a web platform, a production archive and a work biography at the same time. 
It's made up of um, ARD um, archive material and also material from Sundaram's private archive. At the center are 66 films and broadcast reports. Grouped around them are documents, letters, manuscripts, photographs, correspondences, as well as lectures. So um, once you enter the page, this is the starting page, and then you scroll down, you enter what we call the foyer or the, the, the entry page, basically. And you find a little collection of the material from inside the archive here which is a trailer, which is more or less uh, a, a little bit similar to the introduction you just saw from here to here, from film from here to here. Um, we have quotes of Navi by Navina, we have, um, we have photos, and we also have a letter which refers to the title of the whole archive. And um, actually, if you press here, you hear I'm my voice reading the letter in German, and I will read it now to you in English. Madhu has already mentioned it. Hamburg. 21st of July, 1969. Dear Mummy, I hope this gets you before you go down to Delhi. Today, I'm leaving for four days to do some filming in Heidelberg. I will be back on Thursday. Tonight, as the three astronauts land on the moon, millions of television viewers will be watching. It is a fantastic thought. So many billions of miles away and actually, for all practical reasons, it is as far as Vietnam, which is across the room, the fifth wall. German TV surpasses itself or overdoes it and broadcasts the night through. I won't be staying up, I can assure you, but I will be watching for a while. I must do some preparatory work for Heidelberg now, so look after yourself. All my love, yours, Navina. We go down, we come to the registration or login uh, section, which is uh, just to be mentioned, the registration here is a control mechanism that Navina Sundaram insisted upon as she fears racist and right-wing interference. And she's right to do so because all her career through, she was a victim of um, racist letters, as you heard in the introduction, but also calls and, and threats. And also we felt it is good to have a somehow protected space within the web because it's somehow also very private and sensible material inside the archive. But just to let you know, the registration is free. You are just registered uh, by your email address and you get immediate access to the entire archive. And we now move right into it, which is going here. <clears throat> so um, I will scroll down and I will talk you a little bit about the architecture of the archive. As a constantly changing structure, the roots of this archive reach far into the historical and political ramifications of the 20th century, especially its media and television history, which is of course also contemporary political history. Themes such as uh, the global South with a focus of South, South Asia, the Cold War, so-called development policy, class issues and labor, ecology, migration and asylum policy in Germany, they run through the archive. And in addition to this, Navina Sundaram's own experience with public television as a woman and as a migrant become apparent. The archive attempts to bring together all these different traces, contributions and references as a mosaic, which is also the pattern we chose for the design. At first glance, these materials and their different kinds of language, private language, professional language, stand side by side like fragments of memory. Seemingly without hierarchy, they form an assemblage <clears throat> that is reassembled each time the archive is called up. So it's not a fixed structure, it reassembles every time anew when I, when I call up the page. The objects are interrupted by black spaces that refer to the gaps and fractions of the archive. Because even this archive itself, it's only an excerpt, it's incomplete and can only ever remain fragmentary. Please allow me a short note here, um, <clears throat> because the archive project, the fifth wall, the fifth wall is a digital work biography and a production archive, but at the same time, it is also an intervention into existing archival practices. The archives of public television in Germany are not public at all. It's very hard to enter if you are not a scientist or a journalist, and even then you must know already in advance what you want, be lucky that it still exists and invest a lot of money for copying purposes. 
In spite of all these barriers, barriers, or in fact, because of them, we decided to intervene into this archival metabolism of television and extract the works by Navina Sundaram to make them accessible to the public. We, that is me and my colleague Marek Benino, unfortunately can't be with me today. And why Navina? We believe that her works offers a specific perspective that needs to be highlighted and should not disappear. Public television in the 1960s, 70s and 80s, and I think even until today, is a highly competitive, largely white male world. Navina Sundaram took a very specific view in this, which was almost unique in German television at the time and stemmed from her specific, what Mareike always calls situatedness. Between tree and bark, Navina calls it herself. It's a migrant situated knowledge between India and Germany, between here and there, between inside and outside. And Mareike and I have been very glad actually to not be on our just isolated and alone in this, um, you know, trying to develop um, an archival practice, but um, being part of a context called Archive Außer Sich, that's hard to translate, it's actually called Archives Beyond Themselves or also Enraged Archives, and I will just quickly <clears throat> change to this website, Archive Außer Sich, uh, was initiated by Arsenal Cinema in Berlin. And uh, it's an assembly of international archival projects, which all have a or share a kind of critical uh, attitude towards archives and archival practice. Um, there are projects from Egypt, from Sudan, from Indonesia, and also three of us here today um, met actually through this um, wonderful context. And that's, for example, the Harun Faraki Institute was also part of it. And also um, Deepa Danraj and Uganda's films have been um, um, have been restored and digitized within the context of Archive Außer Sich. So um, back to the fifth wall, though. Um, of course, this is not just, you know, um, a, a nice pattern and a nice mosaic to look at, because it's also a work, uh, uh, a work archive. It's an archive in which you are uh, supposed to work if you want. So um, it, uh, it has different tools, which I would like to introduce very shortly. Um, Actually, um, this archive, we always don't know if we call it an archive or if it's more a collection, um, because it's just an extract from the bigger archive. So it's not unlimited. It's, it's, it's like a shelf from the public television archive. So we decided to not have a filter function, or actually we have only one filter function. And that is, um, here we go. Um, this, that is the free search engine. So you can search by title or you can search by a keyword and then you get only the results of what you were searching for. Otherwise, we have inserted um, uh, several sorting, sorting uh, tools. That means that um, as if you have a shelf full of material, but the material remains always the same. It's just resorting itself, rearranging itself. So for example, if you go here to Archivalien, which means kinds of material, um, then you start with all the films and um, the photos, text, letters, commentaries. So if I click to photo, it brings me to the photos, but the films are still there. Up you see, so it's more uh, an orientation tool. So if I now uh, go down and I click on one of the photos, then all, um, the, with many photos, it's the case that behind one photo, there's a series or a slideshow of photos hidden. So you can uh, explore even more. Then we come to the chapter text, which basically is a collection of um, essays, articles, lectures, manuscripts by Navina. And as you can see here, it's both in German and English language because uh, it's, it's targeted to different audiences, both in Germany and India. And um, there's really, I mean, for example, here, this is a text I really like from 1983. That was a lecture Navina held in the, at the film workshop in Chennai, actually. And it's called Transfer of Communication. So it's really worth uh, exploring these texts, also for English um, readers. Then we come to the letters um, chapter. Letters means letters Navina wrote to her parents or to Vivan Sundaram, her brother, from between 1964 and 71. So that's basically the time when she traveled back and forth a lot and before she decided to permanently settle in Germany. And then down here we have the commentaries, which is um, 
um, edited snippets of interviews we did with Navina in 2004 and 2018, but also, and that's very important, um, we didn't want Navina to be to remain alone and separate in, in this archive. So we asked people who are long-term companions or colleagues of Navina, film professionals and academics, to comment on certain films, on single films. So, for example, you find here, of course, myself and Philip Schaffner, and there is Madhushri Datta who commented a uh, portrait of a patriot, Navina's film on Subhash Chandra Bose, or also Vivan Sundaram commenting Navina's film on uh, Amrita Shagil, a family album. Then, um, if uh, you go to the next sorting tool um, that is called, um, I just quickly go here again. Um, it's called themes and themes actually reflects in a very good way the curatorial aspect of the of the archive, because we really took a long time to decide on how to how to offer what 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 are we offering thematically what. Uh, um, how do we structure the archive thematically we first thought we do it like uh, a television um, or newspapers where. Uh, were ordered uh, in earlier times, like historically, for example, like economy, politics, interior politics, exterior politics. But then what is interior for Navina? So um, we decided to switch on over and uh, take a, a, a viewpoint from today and also to reflect uh, Navina's situatedness and her refusal to locate herself in only one place. So we don't have a Eurocentric um, angle, I hope. So it's not Germany, Europe, and then the rest of the world, but we try to, to look at it from a multi-perspective POV. And so the themes today are media, migration, international politics, decolonization, culture, human rights, racism, labor relations, gender, global economy, and others. Then you can also um, sort by program. So if you look for a certain program like Asiatic Maniatros, you find only um, these um, productions or also to, uh, through the year of production. And um, <clears throat> the last space I would like to mention is the workspace. This is something which is not yet ready, but we want it to become growing and interactive um, even more in the future. But basically it's a place in which we hope to assemble different parts through the archive, extract curatorial perspectives done by others. I mean, taken by others. So it already has, um, some um, entries like uh, a radio program which was just broadcasted a couple of weeks back or not last week actually um, on Navina Sundaram or a cinema series which we are actually doing now uh, with uh, Cinema Transtopia here in Berlin on the migration issue of uh, several films of Navina. So that's basically it. I just um, stop here for today. And I hand over back to Madhu. I'm sorry that was a rush through the archive, but I hope you got a glimpse through this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marla. I mean, uh, yeah, it was a very tough task to really give us a sense of uh, this dense endeavor. What a dense work, but uh, how, um, um, uh, but uh, you make it really easy and really uh, simple. I mean, that that one thing I um, always appreciate in your work. And here is a very interesting combination of your interest and Navina's interest is accessibility. You know, the, the, this accessibility is a huge amount of work which must have gone into building this archive, building the architecture of the archive, imagining it, uh, what different ways of cataloging, what different ways of looking at, keeping it open, being sensitive, uh, think about the sensitive materials, still believe in public culture, public access. There are so many concepts going, running parallelly and eating into each other's space. And like you make a commitment to one cause and suddenly that start conflicting with the other cause. And but but um, uh, it's like um, uh, Navina's personality. You make it accessible. You make it easy. You don't make it so uh, difficult to get in. And that's that's public culture. That is public television, public archive. That that I mean, there is nothing uh, uh, wrong in having um, non-accessible work. I'm all for that. But this public culture and making uh, uh, the rendering easy and accessible um, is very essential. And that's very um, 
pertinent in your work and also in Navina's work. So now that we are in the archive, I want the, uh, to ask you the first question, which is um, about the archive and about Germany. Now, I'm not being Eurocentric, but it is about German television. So we'll come back to Germany again and again while discussing this archive, come on. Uh, is that, um, how do you, I, I mean, it's, it's also a very rare thing that a public television, whether temperamentally it was public or not, but structurally, legally, a public um, enterprise, public, uh, we call it public sector, uh, archive being open um, to be accessible uh, to people is a very rare event. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big thing. It's a big thing in media history, but Volker will be the person to comment on uh, it uh, later on. What does it mean politically? I mean, this is of course one um, prime example of what does it mean? What is the possibility? What is the potential? But how do you think it can have a dialogue with the contemporary German uh, politics and art practice? It's a difficult uh, question to answer shortly, but um, basically if, if history, I mean, that's something I think about a lot uh, also while I'm writing novels is if history as we learned it is really a colonial and, and patriarchal and hierarchical, hierarchical structure, then we should tools not just to deconstruct it and to unlearn it, but also to restructure it. And, and I feel that these are the tools I try to develop right now for myself and also for others. And um, like television um, in Germany, at least from, from mid 20th century um, until some point after 2000, when the moving image became digital, linear television was somehow the, the, the primary source of information for, for, for most of the people. So I think um, most of these archives, they have never been public although it's called public TV um, and we paid for it basically with our taxes, but um, now they become digital. And, and, and the question comes up, who owns them, first of all, then who, um, who has access to them and who decides what to do with them. And actually the fifth wall has been designed um, also to place an example and to form a model and to actively reclaim a certain shelf in this, in this, in this public television archive and to carefully hand it back to the public um, you know, not just throwing it onto YouTube, but uh, building a curatorial home for this archive. And the second, what I would like to mention is that um, with the films and the letters and the text of Navina Sundaram, we wanted to bring back a voice which had um, not actually been silenced, but um, at least not kept alive. Uh, on different levels. So there, there, there is a woman who claimed to be in current affairs. Yes, this is the first, uh, first thing. Then there is a migrant from the South who dared to demand to speak about both India and Germany as an expert. And thirdly, there's a political person, a political subject who always took a standpoint and did not hide her position. So um, what we try uh, with this archive is actually to rewrite history in a multi-vocational uh, way, yeah, basically. So that's very um, that's very current. I feel. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Mala, I know that this is this is a much uh, longer uh, question, but we'll come back to it. Uh, I, I I would like to bring uh, Shashi uh, Kumar here because of his uh, long standing. He is the uh, insider, uh, outsider insider. He was in uh, uh, Indian public television. Doodarshan. Then he was also uh, initiator of the first independent regional language uh, television network, Asianet. So uh, Shashi, uh, how do you um, see, I mean, what could be the parallel or not parallel uh, period uh, of India that you think that we can look at Doodarshan's archive if it is possible at any point technically? Uh, to uh, rework our contemporary history. Uh, thank you, Madhushri. Unfortunately, Doordarshan hasn't had a comparable record of archiving. Um, not in the uh, heyday of Doordarshan in the 70s, not in the 80s. This is the, the period I engaged with Doordarshan well until the early 90s. Um, and if it had, it was part of a larger political project. So not archiving 
on the merit of what needs to be archived. There will be shocking examples of very important content uh, being erased because you needed the tape for a quick ribbon cutting by a minister. Uh, I mean, this is not, not an exaggeration. There are umpteen examples of this in, in Doordarshan. So Doordarshan is no exemplar in terms of archiving, unlike, say, a films division, for instance. You had a fairly healthy archive in the films division for a period of time. So for those of us who worked on documentaries in Doordarshan, uh, or even later in my feature film, uh, I got the archival material all from films division, although I should have been able to get something from Doordarshan because I had better access to it, but there, there's no archive there. And you despair about the kind of uh, documentaries that we have produced for Doordarshan, uh, hardly any of it will be available there. Unlike All India Radio, for example, again, it has a far better you know, uh, record in terms of archiving, particularly arts and classical music and so on and so forth. So I just want to therefore say that archiving, to, re to reiterate, it's a, it's a political project in India. And I would bookend this whole problem of archiving. I think we need to problematize archiving in India uh, because is it even desirable for Doordarshan to archive, have an efficient archive? Because what are you going to archive? Are you going to archive a narrative which is contrary to the facts, a narrative which is, uh, 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 shall we say, a setting the agenda narrative and so on and so forth? Uh, and I therefore bookended, say, between uh, the infamous time capsule experiment of Indira Gandhi in the 1970s. You know, in the early years of Indira Gandhi, uh, she buried what's called the time capsule in the Red Fort. Uh, it raised, there was a huge furor about it. And this was the time I was in college and doing my post graduation in Madras Christian College. I mentioned that because the author of the 30 pages of history in that time capsule. Uh, was my professor of history at Madras Christian College, Professor Krishna Swami. I mean, he's, he, he is no more. And he was a wonderful teacher. He was a great, you know, we looked up to him. He was a, he was a great teacher of history. Uh, and he then, you know, happened to have written the, this archival material and sent it to an archivist called Mr. Badrinath, uh, who, 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 who was in charge, the director of the archives in, in, in Chennai. And Badrinath looked at it and, fa and found it astounding and shocking because it was, it was actually about uh, all about Mrs. Gandhi and about the Nehru dynasty. And it seemed to suggest that the history of independent India until then, this was on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of independence, uh, you know, in 73, 1973, was all the doing of Nehru and, uh, and Mrs. Gandhi. Now that is one end of that. And the other bookend part is today where there's a conscious, systematic, meticulous uh, program, not just an attempt, underway to erase all of the legitimate history of post-independent India, to airbrush away, uh, you know, including Nehru, uh, to airbrush important personalities who have played a, a decisive, definitive role in post-independent India. So this is the dilemma or you know or that that you have in terms of archiving in between of course there are some highlights some some sparks again uh, there was a the 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 time capsule again buried in in gujarat in 2011 uh, which uh, again raised a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, furor because it was about the modi government and about the rule of the uh, modi and seemed to wipe out everything else there was talk about a time capsule being buried under the Ram Mandir uh, in, the Ram, in the context of the Ram Janma um, movement or agitation, as it were. However, the, the secretary of the, of the uh, uh, Ram Janma Bhumi Trust uh, has clarified that there, that there is no such attempt. But there were press reports at that time, or maybe there was a, an idea it was given up, or maybe it was, a, it was misreporting. But this is, the, this is the essence of the problem of uh, archiving in India. Uh, and therefore, I think th this is one aspect. I quickly want to just, just connect it to the problem that do, is it a wise idea to have a very efficient archiving system when you're actually making history malleable and ductile as you like, you know, depending on who's in power in a particular context. And I think the Congress did it, the BJP is doing it. I mean, it's like the Congress 
you know, you 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 sow the wind and the, and and you're reaping the whirlwind now. You know, in, in terms of the BJP, that's what's happened. Uh, it's it's coming back to you multifold in terms of this aspect of uh, personality celebration and archiving and appropriating uh, all the credit for yourself. The, uh, the 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 problem, therefore, is uh, what do you do in a situation where? Uh, it, I mean, we have heard this story in the cliches about history being the account of the, the victor and so on and so forth. So you have in the Indian context, I think, in, in official India's record of archives, particularly the media in Doordarshan, I think would be a very, very uh, uh, problematic, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the area to, to tread uh, because the, I mean, I'm reminded of Nietzsche where he said, the history of truth is the history of the longest lasting falsehood. You know, it, it's a bit like that. So if you archive and archive and archive a series of untruths, that then goes for the truth. And uh, I'm almost wary about archiving in such a climate, in such a situation, which is, of course, this is, this is very different from uh, the, the fifth wall concept or, you know, what's happening in public television con context in Germany. In fact, the idea, uh, the, the, the title of the archive fifth wall triggered this, this idea in me or this, 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 mischievous thought in me that in India, you have the idea of the fourth estate and the fifth, you know, a section of the fourth estate, unfortunately, to, unfortunately today, could be characterized as the fifth column of democracy, as the fifth column of democracy itself. Because the media, which we want to mark archive, is itself becoming a, 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 a problem, is, is, is counterposed against democracy, a section of the media and television media. I'm talking about television. We are, we are aware of this on a daily basis here. And then there's the, the, the added compounding problem that uh, modern technology, and since I deal with millennials in the Asian College of Journalism you know, for the last 20 years, one of the uh, convictions that I'm growing with is that the digital disruption has made a difference to, our, to the way the millennial generation thinks about the past, about archiving. Uh, there's a premium in some ways of breaking, of disrupting. Uh, of creating new paradigms, as it were, you know, of, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a premium on the idea of endism. There's a premium on the idea of disruption. Of course, you know, talk, we don't have to go into Francis Fukuyama and his uh, largely discredited theories, uh, luckily, about end of history and the last man or the, last, the great disruption and so on. But you can see that digital technology uh, it celebrates itself, grows through disruption, to constant disruption. So, the disruptive is the, uh, is the mode with which the millennial mindset moves forward, is my sense, and the disruptive is at a premium. Such a context, what is the importance of continuity is something we need to ask ourselves. I'm not saying, suggesting it's unimportant. I'm saying, is it being interrogated? Is it being challenged? Uh, do we need to think about it in new terms? Do we need a paradigm shift in the terms, in, in the ways that we understand the, uh, the archive? So this is you know, broadly the the context that I, I would bring to this. Uh, and I mean, as Derrida said, there is no political power without control of archive, if not of memory. There is no political power without control of archive, if not of memory. And India is, a, I think, a living example of that, particularly here and now under the current uh, government that we have, because uh, I think there's an attempt to create undo you know, unlearn, uh, Merle used the term unlearn in a positive sense. This is a conscious bit to undo uh, what should be part of a legitimate archive and create and make a quantum leap into a new archive uh, with nothing to show for it, literally. You know, so, so these are the kind of dangers that we are, we are grappling with, I think, here today. Thanks, um, Shashi. I couldn't have agreed with you uh, any less. Uh, the danger of archiving one kind or the privileges of archiving, which will go very close to the museum practice. Those archives will be called themselves archive, but they will have more have common with uh, uh, museum politics. Uh, and then cataloging and annotation, how you do it. But I want to put a little note of dissent that even if it is a, uh, 
it is a tool of fascist ideology, which uh, uh, Germany knows it very well. Germany always archive itself. In whatever political phase they are, they are famous for archiving themselves. But I want to talk about one film, which I'm sure uh, Mamala and uh, Fulker is very uh, familiar with. It's Andri Uzika's film, with which um, Harun Faruqi was also involved. It's called The Autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu. Uh, it is a three hours long film only made of official state footage of Chichesku doing formal, uh, what you call ribbon cutting in various places that uh, his travel and not a word, not a, not a frame from outside. It's just teaching of those. It's a fantastic uh, narrative about um, yeah, uh, about a revolutionary turning uh, fascist. You know, it's, it's just a three hours long. It's, it's, it is autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu. I know these are rare events where you can take the uh, mainstream ways of history and can put it uh, on its uh, head. It, it, that's not common. And we have a danger of taking that as, um, as, as a confirmed and uninterventionable um, truth. But, um, but I think that footprints, I mean, uh, footprints of, I mean, a giant's footprint or a right winger's footprints also very important for me to look back at. So it should not be only an archive of, uh, of movement, social movement, political movement. It, it should be also, um, also, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, how many times uh, Modi appears on public media today? After 20 years, that will be very important to see. So I don't mind uh, uh, they uh, doing their uh, this official uh, state program uh, archiving. That that would have been that would have given us a better um, uh, footage on on say um, either Ayodhya in '92 or um, emergency or um, uh, sick program, but you know this. Film division had done because film division had individual uh, filmmakers. They many a times subverted it. They're, they're full of subver subverting elements. They are not really Sarkari or the government thing. Uh, we uh, It's becoming an internal dialogue. We can go on on it, but I'm tempted to now come to Volker. Uh, Volker, you are, I mean, uh, I was just reading your correspondence with uh, Marla, and you are uh, generally uh, involved with archiving of public media. I mean, archiving as, as, as a process, as an architecture, as technology, uh, all these things is also your interest, right? I mean, uh, uh, the, the design, the aesthetics and the access. Uh, so what do you think in the context of what Shashi said? I mean, it's not that um, uh, right-wing presence uh, is uh, not there in European uh, public media. Uh, so what do you think, how do, do these dangers um, can be uh, attended? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks so much first for um, having me in this conversation. It's really, I'm, I'm learning a lot and it's also nice, I mean, I think, this example of the fifth wall, it's some, it's more like a prototype almost or a model. And I, I, I think that it's very much targeted to the future and it sets the bar very high. And I would maybe like to come back to the, this paradox that Merle mentioned, which is I think at the core of some of the things that we're discussing that this public television is not really public, that it has de facto turned the, into private archives. And um, maybe just two, two remarks that come from the present, I think just a few days ago, one of the CDU politicians, that's not even the right wing AfD party, but a CDU conservative politician in Sachsen-Anhalt, one of the lender, he said that, um, well, why, why do we have two public channels? Maybe, it's a, maybe one of the two channels, ARD, could also be eliminated or abolished. And then he said, ah, oh, no, no, I was misunderstood. But of course, that's what he meant. Uh, this is one example. And the second example is um, A.L. Kennedy, the, the writer um, who has a column in Süddeutsche Zeitung. And she talks about uh, Great Britain. Uh, she has a very pessimistic view on Brexit, on Johnson, on everything. But she also mentions that BBC, which was the model for German public television as well after Second World War, 
um, is very much uh, menaced by being defunded. So um, those, this is just two examples that um, I think public television is really in a, in a very difficult situation and with its back to its wall. And this is where I think uh, projects like Merle's project and like some of the other projects in Archive Außer Sich at Arsenal come into play. Um, because I think it shows what kind of asset uh, the archives, television archives, uh, public archives are, and that this could really be turned into an advantage. And this is one of the reasons why public television, the history and the presence of public television is so important. And so what I think is needed um, is uh, the realization that the, the, the value of the archive is not a financial value, it's not an economic value, but it's different kinds of values which cannot really be measured. They are ed educational values, cultural values, historical values, and a project like the Fifth Wall, I think it, it displays this and it shows uh, how important it is. And this is why I think, I mean, this would be like the optimistic way of looking at it. I think um, TV channels would have to see this like NDR did, I think in, in your case, uh, see this as an opportunity to, to, um, to look for coalitions. Um, I mean, many people speak about public-private partnerships, et cetera. I think in this case, it would rather be public-public partnerships um, because the, the arguments that uh, TV archives usually have, it's always the same obstacles that you run into. They, they, and and they're, they're probably right if they say, we don't have the time to care, take care of this. We don't have um, the money to take care of this. And uh, it's, it's not really part of our job description to, to um, curatorially work with the archive. And to start with, I mean, Sashi mentioned this, they were uh, designed as production archives. They were never meant to be archives with a cultural um, uh, heritage. And so, um, but of course they are archives right now. And uh, I think the partnerships should be um, to find people who are really have a genuine interest like Merle and others had in Navina Sundaram and then uh, create projects where people like you can work with the archive and do this in this very responsible way. I mean, this is where the dangers come in. I think the fifth wall, what it shows is that on all these levels of saving um, uh, content, making it accessible, but then also curatorially framing it, um, it's, it's something very, I mean, there's so much reflection in it that it's really, it's an example where I think, okay, this is for, for everyone who's working with public archives, he or she can, can look at it and then see, oh, how, what can I learn from it? And um, I think the curatorial um, approach is absolutely essential because some of the public or public television has started to move in a certain direction. In Germany, at least, um, quite a lot of content has been made available from the early times of television. But then it's just, uh, they just put it online and think that's it. Uh, and of course, if it's just there, it's there for anyone to take it and to do whatever he or she likes. So I think it needs this the framing aspect that Merle has so beautifully shown uh, to see, okay, what, what is the context? What are other documents around this? Uh, and, and what is this counter history, which is part of the official archives? Um, so I think it's just the tip of an iceberg that, that's visible in the fifth wall. Um, and I hope that more of it uh, finds, finds its way into, into the hands of the people who have basically financed it. Well, um, Fulker, um, um, thanks very, uh, very much. I mean, that will bring me to my next question to Marla, that whether this archive is a narrative or is it, is it, is it a material, is a collection of material. But before that, I would like to uh, mention that, you know, you are talking about, what you are talking about archiving is not the material of it, as if material exists, mm -hmm. and then we organize them, we uh, facilitate them, we open it up. But what um, uh, Shashi is trying to say, and as a practicing documentary filmmaker, I know it very well, materiality is a major issue in our country. Uh, one is our callousness, one is lack of money, second is lack of money, and third is our climate. So uh, material, especially in celluloid days, got spoiled very easily. And then of course, callousness, people just throw it away, space crunch, various other reasons. So if material does not exist, then how do you archive? Archive doesn't produce material. It's just 
collected. So lack of materiality has been a major uh, issue, but th th those issues also brought in various different creative strategies. So uh, yeah, Marla. So the, is this archive in a way a reading or is it a material? Is it, is it, is it a raw material to do the reading? Is it a, a narrative by itself? No, certainly it's a kind of in-between um, tool, which also is new or has been new for me because I'm a writer and I'm a documentary filmmaker myself. And so usually I use to take control over a narrative, right? So I write a book or I do a documentary and I, I am in full control. But in a way, I fe it felt just not, it doesn't feel, uh, it doesn't feel, um, Right, because, for example, um, Navina has the documentary practice, right? I mean, it comes out if you watch not just one film or not just an excerpt, but if you watch different of her films. So if I come as a documentary filmmaker, I impose my practice on her practice and her practice in a way disappears. So I form a linear narrative which somehow uh, over, overthrows her own. And, and what I find so great uh, about working in a, in a multi-layered, you know, non-linear way with such an archival uh, material is that you have different narratives. I don't find it um, arbitrary or, you know, like an assembly of, of, of miscellaneous. I feel it's more like it offers different narrative uh, narratives, which are very strong. Um, but um, I, I've been thinking about what, what Sashi said right now. And, and of course, if you, if you, if you want to have a more multi-perspective view onto archives and an approach which is more open and which gives you different readings, then it's two sides of the coin, right? I mean, of course, right-wing people also do rewrite history and I'm very aware of this, but um, what I want to actually um, encourage is to, to trust in, 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 a, in a media literacy of the coming um, generations that we form offers, we, we offer um, archival spaces in which such a literacy can, can develop, you know? Um, that's that's maybe just a keyword I would like to throw in. Throw in, and the second is that okay, um, state archives are one are one dimension, but there are other archives which also exist. Um, like uh, Majlis, um, I, I remember being in your space long, long ago and finding an archive which was so valuable to me. And these are also vulnerable archives, especially in times of. Um, you know, uh, political, whatever. I mean, like where, where there's, this, uh, so they have to be protected, right? Um, um, these these archives, which existed just um, out of private or organizational um, efforts. Yeah. I must tell my co-panelists that we'll be really judicious with time. We are already running late. And Navina's friends are getting impatient. I'm seeing the chat, where is Navina as if, we are stealing the time from her. Uh, Navina will be joining us later. It has been scripted. Please hang on there, but we can still see her. So Rav, can we see Navina's works, please? The clip? Yeah, sure. Auf dem Flughafen Bissalanka hatte das diplomatische Korps anderthalb Stunden lang geduldig gewartet. Vertreter der Volksrepublik China, Russlands, Frankreichs, der USA, der DDR und verschiedener schwarzafrikanischen Länder, die gekommen waren, um einem ermordeten Revolutionär ihre Reverenz zu erweisen. Auf diesen Augenblick hatte das Land drei Jahre lang gewartet. Auf die Rückkehr der sterblichen Überreste Amilcar Cabrals, des Gründers der Einheitspartei und des Führers des Unabhängigkeitskampfes. Premierminister Sheikh Mujibur Rahman ist der unbestrittene Führer von Bangladesch. Er wird als Vater der Nation und, wie sein offizieller Titel lautet, als Freund der Bengalen verehrt. Die Freiheitsbewegung erhielt ihre Triebkraft durch die ausbeuterische Politik, die Westpakistan in Ostpakistan betrieb und durch die daraus folgenden sozialen Spannungen, aber auch durch die Persönlichkeit Sheikh Mujibur Rahmans. Die Zeit des Bürgerkrieges verbrachte er zwar als Gefangener in Westpakistan, doch das trug nur umso mehr zur Legendenbildung um seine Person bei. Auf die Frage eines Journalisten, was seine besondere Stärke als Regierungschef sei, antwortete Mujibur Rahman, 
dass ich mein Volk liebe. Und seine Schwäche? Dass ich mein Volk zu sehr liebe. Mujibur Rahman spielt die Rolle des freundlichen Patriarchen gern. 150.000 Menschen haben aus purer Angst die Stadt fluchtartig verlassen. Nicht die Pakistani oder Bangladeschi, sondern indische Moslems, die zurück in ihre Heimatdörfer drängten. Für sie wurde die goldene Stadt ihrer Träume zum Albtraum. Das Dröhnen der spanischen Kampfflugzeuge, die ihre Ehrenrunden für General Salazar drehten, ersetzte die Musik einer fehlenden Kapelle. Man nahm Abschied ohne Fahnen, ohne Parade. Eine Kolonie wurde aufgegeben und wie immer war es ein Abgang ohne Ehre. Ausgehandelt eine Einigung zwischen Marokko und Mauritanien, die Algerien nicht akzeptiert. Missachtet den Selbstbestimmungswunsch der Sahara-Einwohner und immer lauter den Lärm eines nahenden Krieges. Ein neuer Krisenherd ist entstanden. Mit Verhängung des Ausnahmezustandes vor zwei Jahren ging der Sozialistenführer und Gewerkschaftsboss in den Untergrund, ließ Güterzüge entgleisen und bombardierte Regierungschefin Indira Gandhi mit Manifesten. Nach seiner Festnahme im Juni 1976 verbrachte er neun Monate in einer Sicherheitszelle. Der Verschwörung zum gewaltsamen Sturz der Zentralregierung angeklagt, wurde Fernandes dem Richter in Ketten vorgeführt. Die sozialistische internationale Drang auf Hafterleichterung. So konnte Fernandes noch vom Gefängnis aus einen erfolgreichen Wahlkampf führen. Nach 45 Jahren wird das Volk nicht länger warten auf die Gerichte. Unsinn, das zu glauben. Jagjivan Ram, Führer der Janta-Partei. Sollte er Premierminister werden, wäre das etwas Außerordentliches für Indien, denn der 72-Jährige ist ein Harijan, ein Unberührbarer. Hinter ihm stehen 85 Millionen entrechtete Menschen, jene tief unten im Kastensystem. Früher stimmten sie für Indira Gandhi, eine Brahmanin. Aber die Aussicht, dass eine der ihren das höchste Amt bekleiden könnte, wäre Anlass genug, auf Jagjivan Ram umzuschwenken. Mit derselben Zuversicht wie Indira Gandhi erklärt auch der Veteran der indischen Politik, für eine Koalition gibt es keine Notwendigkeit, denn wir werden die absolute Mehrheit erreichen. Die Hinterlassenschaft der schwedischen Dynamitproduzenten und Pazifisten Alfred Nobel fängt an, sauer zu werden. Der Nobelfriedenspreis 1973 geht an den US-Außenminister Henry Kissinger und an den Mitglied des nordvietnamesischen Politbüros Le Ducteau. Telegraphic orders are rushed to all police stations in British colonial India. But Bose gets away. Well, that's only um, a very um, limited um, number of works because these are the uh, these are extracted from the films which SSA will be showing in next uh, weeks. Uh, so these are English subtitles, and that's why you could take clips from it. But it gives you an idea about the range uh, that um, she had in terms of geographical expanse, uh, uh, political um, uh, realities, and also forms, different kinds of forms. So I come to the person of documentary form in this uh, panel, uh, Deepa Dhanraj, a long-term friend, associate, contemporary of Navina Sundaram. Deepa, the question to you is very obvious. Um, I think you can predict it. Uh, is that, um, so how do we look at the form uh, between uh, television, um, television channel 
and um, an independent documentary. You are one person who have never worked for television. Your friend Navina has never worked as an independent filmmaker. Uh, but obviously there is, um, uh, uh, there is a camaraderie, there is an exchange. How does uh, uh, this outreach, the number of outreach and also the uh, forum of outreach influences the, um, influence the, uh, form of the documentary and i'm just adding the next question to it so that you can attend to it together the location of the filmmaker how much uh, does it influence uh, the language of it the form of it in the context of 90s when you and uh, navina both worked extensively on these questions that is precisely uh, post ayodhya during ayodhya time I will not speak now, but I give you seven minutes. We are really running out of time. I'm sorry. Uh, so just to go back, Merla mentioned the 1983, uh, the talk that Navina gave in the Goethe Institute in uh, Madras. And we were there at the time. And I remember that workshop uh, very clearly because uh, it was a way to facilitate, you know, uh, documentary exchange and uh, and we presented one of our films, which was then. Um, so that was a chance then really to uh, speak to each other, apart from friendship, of course, but to speak to each other about filmmaking. And um, so that's just briefly to, to, you know, credit you for that paper and uh, to remind us of that time. But I have to say that, you know, we were, we were given the chance to watch these films uh, that were English subtitled and I've been watching them. And, uh, and frankly, I'm just uh, completely gobsmacked, just stunned, you know, at, uh, at not only the range of what the kinds of, um, you can call them current affairs, but actually they were really, really important, very crucial, uh, historical moments, you know, especially the Bangladesh, uh, the whole uh, whole uh, coverage of what happened post uh, the victory. Uh, um, that is one. Then the, of course, the '92 Bombay riots. That was another huge uh, episode which she covered, and of course George Fernandez, uh, the post the emergency, Mrs. Gandhi, uh, you know, her re-election uh, coming back, that re-election trail, and. To me, it's, it, it's uh, okay, first I have to say, you know, I really envy her access. You know, for independent documentary filmmakers, nobody, I mean, for you to go in there and get time with somebody like Mujibur Rahman or Mrs. Gandhi, or at any of these points, I think what NDR gave her was, I mean, it's fantastic to have that access. I really admire that, but, when you look at the films, for me, it's such a um, uh, um, collapsing of time, you know, especially the Indian content because, and the Bangladeshi content, in terms of where we are today with, the, with what's happening uh, with the Hindutva project, okay? You go back, you, you, you see what's happening in 92. And what's interesting to me is that Navina had to report something that is, um, quite complicated in terms of Indian history, quite complicated. And you have to unpack it for uh, basically a German audience. So, you know, and I think it's such a challenge and I do want to have a longer conversation with her about that, of how do you, how do you create context? How do you create uh, the, these local histories so that this will be understood? For example, someone like Bal Thakre, okay? Someone like the Shiv Sena, what, what is that Shiv Sena? What is that uh, formation? Um, and I think, I think she did it extremely well. I mean, I really think she, she in, uh, well, the main element that uh, she uses, of course, because I suppose German television wanted it is the narration, you know, that you have to have narration and you have to have the overdubbed German voices for people who speak any other language. But the narration for me, when I, when I listen to uh, Navina's narration, it's, um, it's extremely analytical. It, it's, uh, it's got a uh, uh, very political tone in the sense, and it's really, 
coming from a place uh, where uh, which reflect contemporary indian political debates you know which she has managed to convey at, at that moment uh, in germany and this is not uh, this is not an easy uh, easy task you know to do um the other thing is that you see her interview technique i mean i, I was uh, particularly in the george fernandes one because we, we do know where george fernandes ended up right um i mean his beginnings this radical socialist uh, fiery trade unionist his incarceration he becomes a minister and then it's downhill from there you know i mean in the, in the sense of initially even resisting um, rss people being part of cabinet for all that we we know what happens later her film stops before that but uh, there is a way in which she uh, you know uh, madhushri spoke about her humor uh, but in th there are these very um, double edged innuendo kind of questions that she puts which are i wouldn't say cheeky but definitely she's uh, she she isn't pulling any punches uh, with these people um yeah so these were the kinds of things that uh, i noticed it's also that you know at a certain stage you also need courage right to to go into these situations i mean you look at the for example the 92 uh, bombay riots i mean she's there she's talking to victims she's um, uh you know victims who have lost family who have uh, been attacked who have you're talking about police collusion you're entering these places very soon after something has occurred and um and i know how hard that is to do uh, because we did a uh, another kind of film where we had to enter these kind of spaces and uh, she has the she yeah she has the courage and i would say even uh, compassion to be when she's in those spaces. So, uh, so these were the kind of things that I uh, sort of noticed in what I watched. Um, that is, I think what, you know, I'm very stunned uh, about Navina is also like, you know, because she lived in Germany, but she kept up with the Indian political uh, debates, conversations, movements, what was happening very closely. Right, and this is also not easy to do to keep track of what's happening in uh, political history in India, not just India but South Asia. So if you take Bangladesh or other countries as well, uh, and then her insistence on doing those stories. Now I'm not sure whether that was challenging to convince German TV uh, that she would uh, to accept these stories. Uh, I want to know more about that. I'm not sure about that, but. But I think uh, the fact that the 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 stories she picked were were absolutely crucial to the big big moments in what was happening in Indian modern politics and political life. I think I'll stop there. At, at less than seven minutes, right, Madhu? <laughs> Not really, but please you can take a little more time if you want to, or you can come back. Yeah, well, I have something to say about the archives, but later. No, say that. There will be no later. We are writing no later. Oh, so very quickly. Now, uh, this was fascinating for me to listen to Sashi, whom I agree with totally about uh, whatever. But, uh, you know, having... Uh, okay, we made a film on the uh, student movement post Rohit Pemula's, um, you know, institutional murder. And... Uh, the archive that we are trying to construct uh, or trying to put together really has enough space for the, the kind of, uh, if you like, not just right wing, but very casteist um, media uh, that was, you know, that was being actually promoted by the ruling party at the time. That's very much part of our archive as well, apart from what students were doing. So what we're trying... And I think the only way to do that really is to have a very strong uh, contextual and curatorial uh, intention uh, and vision as to the way it's put together, you know? So, because if you look for it very quickly, if you look at what the Telugu media was doing, for example, 
right? They were deliberately using Telugu media to push the union government, uh, you know, the union government uh, attack on the students. Now, the thing is this, when you look at it on YouTube, it, it tells you nothing. It's, it's just as it is. As a, but when you start putting it into annotating it, or even uh, having commentary on what's happening at that moment, etc., it is useful. It is useful in a sense to give you the entire contextual picture of that moment. So that's how we're trying to plan our archive. I'm just... Uh, okay, um, I'll have to... Stop here. Yeah, because archive, we have lots of things to uh, also discuss on documentary. Marla, can I invite you to come here? And because you practice documentary from both sides, from documentary film and narrative novel. Um, so, and we are talking about documentary languages. In this case, for um, uh, Deepa, my question was between television and independent uh, documentary. Like while watching Ravina's film, sometimes I thought that with the independent filmmakers, we actually annotate our own footage to its maximum limit, at least what looked like a limit at that point. So maybe less archival potential is there. But a television footage has many ways of looking at it because it is done very precisely. It comes and it is not that somebody has really narrativized around it. Sometimes it's come only as a footage. That's my observation. If I was one of the panelists, I would have argued over that, but uh, I'm not. So uh, my question to you is that how you work between uh, documentary film, non-fiction film and fiction um, writing and both you call documentary practice. How do you, how do you uh, handle it? I think um, for me, the fiction is more um, an extended space of the documentary work. So fiction becomes a space which I can reclaim and totally also control in a way. So I, for some projects, I find it um, necessary to take um, a documentary material into fiction and um, and extend the possibilities, the, the, um, the visions, the utopia also. I mean, both the utopian and maybe also the dystopian potential of the documentary material into fiction. For example, right now I'm 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 writing a kind of or I'm on a way to write a fictional text out of one um, part of this um, archive which is missing. There has been a studio conversation between Navina Sundaram and another journalist on a on a very highly discussed political case of suicide murder um, uh, in, in Germany in the 80s. And this is missing. It's not in the archives anymore. So then wh when I start fictionalizing from this missing part of the archive, it becomes an extended space, a visionary space, actually, a visionary archive, which also is a, which also is a, is a term which was formed by, by um, the whole um, Archiva außer sich um, context or arsenal. Yeah, yeah wonderful. Uh, Volker, so this is my chance to come to you. And uh, so documentary as footage, as raw footage, documentary footage, is it embedded history, which needs to be um, uh, unearthed or separated again and again? Or is it, is it a trap? I mean, which we have uh, all very briefly um, touched, but how will you uh, uh, say that this whole thing of keeping an archive open for to intervention, or it is already embedded history? For, for how do you uh, see the potential and the pitfalls of both these exercises of mm -hmm. keeping it open or finish reading it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we've touched upon some of these aspects, and I very much uh, agree with what what Deepa said. Um, about those, the necessity to curatorially frame it. I think the, the images as such, they're incredibly rich material and everybody knows that there's a lot of access in images. I mean, you, you try to control documentary images, but there's so much more in them that can be activated by different people. It's, it's a great um, promise, but it's also a certain kind of threat. And um, Farocki, there's, there's one text by Harun Farocki, it's, it's called um, Bilder sollen gegen sich selbst aussagen, uh, images should testify against themselves, um, 
which is very much, I think, what Andrei Ujica does uh, in, in the Ceausescu mm -hmm. film. I mean, it's, it's contaminated material, it's toxic material, but he manages to somehow make the, the, the images testify against themselves. I mean, it's just mm -hmm. the images, but there's editing, there's a certain kind of way that he kind of turns them around. Ferrocchi also uses this image like, like an agent. Uh, when an agent uh, comes to the, 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 the enemy party, he can be turned around to, to testify against this this country and I think it's a beautiful image but the ways in which you can uh, act to make them testify against themselves they are they are incredibly varied uh, and Deepa said um, I mean you can put them side by side with other images to make them kind of say something uh, you can annotate them you can use commentary etc and I think all these methods um, need to be activated uh, depending on what kind of material you work with and I think this is something that really, that is probably not um, possible within the logic of how TV channels, how TV archives functions. There's simply not the people who, who have the interest, who are trained to do this. And I think this is why these, these alliances with other people who have a genuine interest, who, who try, who experiment with this kinds of, these kinds of um, uh, curatorial strategies, this is absolutely essential, I think. Um, to, to, to really to keep the dangers that you really you, you have the right to to emphasize to keep them at bay or to yeah to decontaminate uh, uh, archival material also uh, or also to to hand it over to the people who can do this to be to be kind of a go between be, between the archival material and the people who have the right to appropriate it to to reactivate it to use them use them for their emancipatory and, and political struggles. I can see Shashi is um, like really um, ready to go. I'll come to you, Shashi, but I also want to put uh, uh, one uh, note here that uh, Fulka, the thing is that the anxiety that is um, really eating us up our, our, mm -hmm. who are now living in India because um, uh, it, 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 is, it is a regime that is not considered as regime by the world media. So that's bothering mm -hmm. us a lot. And mm -hmm. uh, so when the contaminated uh, or toxic uh, images can read against itself, that time when this reading against itself will uh, come, that time needs to come. That, that is a political ambience that needs to mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. only this reading is possible. Chechesku's Ch Ch regime is over. That's why I could watch now with some kind of sense of uh, world history or Cold War history that one can read. Uh, I mean, Bob Uzika can make this film and I can see this film. Mm -hmm. And um, as it happens that when you leave within, in the middle of this regime, you think it's unending. Such a time will never come again. Mm -hmm. When we can really talk about this time intellectually, artistically. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Shashi, I know you got it. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't yeah. really itching, but I, I just want to say that I, I think it's important to transparency, I think is for me the operative word. Uh, the process of archiving, what is out there, uh, should be transparent. For instance, just to go back to the time capsule story of Indira Gandhi, 1977, when the Janata Party came back to power, the time capsule was exhumed, but not destroyed. As late as 2013, there was an RTI request. I think it was, uh, I forget the name, uh, to, to the government of the, of the new government, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, asking them to, to allow this, uh, uh, to tell us what was in that time capsule. No government wouldn't. So irrespective of the government, there's a kind of complicitness. What is secretive about the archive? You know, mm -hmm. what is secretive about a media archive? I can understand a, a, you know, a defense ministry archive or you know, something like that. What is media by definition is something that's already done. It's a documentary which has been seen, uh, even if it's a, not a television pro product. What is secretive about this archive? In India, you attach a secrecy to the archive as, as the archetype of the time capsule uh, tells us. So I think it's important. Now I think with digital media, with internet, it's possible to have this presence all out there. You can have a, a million YouTube documentaries out there. You can have, I mean, perhaps there has to be a, a consolidation, as uh, Foker said, of, of documentary producers and institutional efforts where you can create a forum for archiving, which is open-ended, which, which has easy exits and entrances, uh, where you can take material and use it or, I mean, so it's, it's, everything is seen. 
I think that's that's important. Otherwise, a archive which is cloaked in secrecy, which 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 is which a proto-fascist dispensation tends to move towards, can become really a rewriting and skewing of history going forward as well. And that I think is very very dangerous. Yes, definitely, definitely. So yeah, so this. Uh, Access is not really an open access. I mean, that, that is where the thing is. But Shashi, now that I, we are talking with you, uh, I come to my last question is that um, pedagogy. So how do we handle uh, pedagogy for creating this kind of archives as tool, as architecture, as space, or also this archive, how it can contribute into the pedagogy since you are, into Asian College of Journalism. I mean, you are the real uh, educator of media uh, students. I would like to hear it from you, the possibilities. Of I wouldn't really presume to, to know too much about this, but my sense is that uh, as far as pedagogy in the media goes, of journalism, which is different from say documentaries and so on, uh, you need to create, it's easy to create an archive, you know, you, you, even recent history can be a very fascinating archive. We have a program at the Asian College of Journalism called Covering Deprivation. Over the last 20 years, every year students go out to do, do remote areas of, uh, of, of the country and they, they, they produce uh, docu, docu features and they do it in various modes, text, video, audio, it's multimedia now and it's digital in any case. And just the sheer comparison and, and you go back to the same village every five years, every seven years, over the last 20 years, gives you a fascinating story of, of the lived lives, you know, of ordinary people. I mean, look at the, how represent, shouldn't archival material be representative of the reality out there? Is it useful to have some kind of, then it's fictional, right? If it's, if it's not to be non-fiction, it has to, how, how representative is the media to begin with, Madhuchi? I mean, imagine there's a time capsule buried today. Yeah. I'll just make this last point. And it, 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 it's a collation of different media samplings, you know, print, television, radio, um, maybe film, etc. And imagine that, God forbid, there's a tsunami and, you know, we are all wiped out. And science fictionally, a thousand years later, a new civilization, some or hundred years later, another you know, civilization comes and looks at this time capsule and tries to infer what India at the, in the 21st century was like. Would you blame that civilization, that future for arriving at the conclusion that India must have been a huge city-state. You know. There'll hardly be any ruralness there. There'll hardly be any countryside there. You know. And if there's ruralness, it'll be in terms of rape, in terms of khatta panchayats, in terms of khap panchayats, in terms of farmer's suicide, which will be seen as some marginal activity going on there. But as a dominant real fact is that 70% of our people live that life. Where is the media representing that life? So how can... So archive, the media itself is skewed. Yeah. It's unrepresentative. So archive cannot be better than that. that that's the unfortunate. Very, very, very important point that if, if media is not representative uh, uh, and then you make an archive and then you say it's a pedagogical tool, it's like going back and back uh, again and again. Marla, you are also an educator. So uh, you, your take on this. Archival, unadri uh, unedited material, as um, ed education. I, I, I said it before, I mean, definitely such is right. So um, there will always be a large portion of our world and reality, which is not in archives. And that is also part of the archives. I mean, what is not there is also part of the archives, right? Uh, and we have to be aware of that. So what I said before about this archival literacy, which I think, um, we, we have to encourage and also explore with the, with the generation who has to deal with all these, you know, um, offers, uh, be it on YouTube, be it in the history books, be it um, by, by people who rewrite history, be it us rewriting history or the right wing rewriting history. So the only thing I can imagine to, um, and, and, and digitizing, I mean, digital, the digital world gives us the possibility to, to develop uh, um, a kind of tools of, of literacy, how to deal with all this information, how to deal with what is there and also what is not there and to be aware what is not there. I don't know, is this too general? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was re busy replying to somebody on the chat who is asking, these are exceptional films. How often is that a journalist gets singled out to be archived in the way that Navina's 
work has been. Is it common practice for German news reporters to have an archive as rich as this? Marla, reply. No, 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 but I, it should be. I mean, it should be, I mean, not for all of them. There are, of course, the one that, that there are the, the white male guys who all have coffee table books now, biographies, like I was the Orientalist, I am the adventurer, I'm the correspondent, so on. So, um, and, and when I wanted, actually in the first place, I wanted to write a book on, on Navina and the publisher said, uh, yeah, but will people remember, you know, um, the, she almost, the name almost faded. And then I was like, no, this is not possible. So I have to make this archive to bring bring the name back into the into the into the discourse. So um, yes, but now I wish that this becomes a model for others. I mean, there's so many others who would be worth having an archive like this. Of course, yes. Okay. So Shirin, you got your answer. Uh, now I'm really running out of time. We have last three four minutes, and I do a television number on you. Okay, so uh, my last question, and this you will have to give two liners on. So who is Namina Sundar? Who starts? Come on, in, on television, we don't have much time. We'll have to do it quickly. Okay, Deepa, you have raised your hand. Um, well, yeah, that's kind of hard for me to say. For me, Navina is a very dear friend. And, and somebody I really admire, whose work I admire. That's what I'd say, yeah. Okay. Shashi, since you don't have such a personal take, it's more interesting to hear yes, you uh, after no, Deepa. I, I, I find her work, I saw most of the films, I mean, all of them, in fact, and I found them very fascinating. Uh, I think uh, she, she, has a, she, she has an entry point and a perspective which makes it very easy for us to understand the context. And at the same time, uh, also gives you the characters, you know, the, the, the nature of each person comes alive, whether it's Subhash Chandra Bose, the conflicting nature as well, you know, and how does he you know, negotiate being what he is, the icon in Indian minds, with someone who, who didn't hesitate to go to uh, the Nazis or to Mussolini to, to, to fight, you know, the, the British, uh, or uh, uh, whether it's George Fernandez, or whether it's Mojibur Rahman, the, the characterizations and the milieu, you know, without, without losing the balance, and to do that on the fly, because you're not, you know, I can see as a television reporter myself, I've done this, you know, it, it's not easy to have this balance when you're shooting all of this, unless you've shot it, you can't really create it in the editing table. So I think uh, it's a very prescient, very uh, comprehensive kind of approach to subjects. And I find that quite uh, fascinating. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an endangered kind of talent, I, I must say, these days. <laughs> Thank you, Folka. I come to you, Marla. Yeah. I'm giving you one more minute to think about your answer, Folka. Yeah, I'm. I'm really thankful to have gotten to know Navina Sundaram via Merle, even if I might have seen uh, parts of her work when I was younger as a child. Um, and but I do know Weltspiegel and those magazine formats that she worked for. And from what I can see is that she managed to really. Uh, I mean, and the, the word courage came up. And I think it's an incredibly courageous way of um, working within certain formats and also finding out what are the limits and where can I also bend the limits of what is possible. And, and the way she takes, especially the way she takes responsible for uh, this kind of journalism uh, by inserting herself, being there as a person, being there with her, with her voice and all this in, in, in a culture and uh, uh, surroundings uh, that, that were marked by and still are in, to a large extent by racism, by ressentiment, by all kinds of things that we've, we've seen also her when she read from the letters she was sent. And I think, I mean, it's, it's really, uh, really a remarkable, both, I mean, remarkably professionally, uh, but also as a person, it's really stunning. Thanks, Merle. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, Merle. <laughs> three three things come to my mind very shortly she herself calls herself the voice of the south and i like this expression the voice of the south and um i personally identify most with between bark and tree um this in between there's actually no space but there is a space and that's where we are and the third is um as Volker said already a, a role model for me um politically alert outspoken and and courageous yeah that's Navina for me 
Well, the voice of the South once told me that she is an old horse in circus. Um, she is actually not keeping, um, she's keeping indifferent health, uh, but she said that when camera is on, she is like an old horse in the circus, she can perform. So we shall have her. Navina, can you please join us here? Like an old horse in circus? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I must say, I am quite overwhelmed having seen all this and, 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 and heard all this. Uh, somebody had said, how many um, journalists have the honor of having an, an entire archive made on them? Um, there are very few. And I've been honored that uh, um, Mala has chosen me because mostly uh, when you get this honor, it's posthumous, but I am still around to be able to reflect and to say something on what I have, uh, what I, uh, what I have seen and, uh, and, and, and to try and try and, uh, and fill in uh, fill in something. Uh, you mentioned that I'm an, an horse that, that immediately starts performing uh, when the red light is on, but uh, it, this is not always quite, um, quite true. I, uh, th there were a couple of points that I wanted uh, uh, to make that maybe one can also See, the, these are 40 years of working life and uh, the bits that I um, have done with great amount of uh, courage was sure that was required. Uh, a lot of fighting was required to uh, fighting for, for getting my way, for putting my foot down, for insisting that what Mallow refers to and what I used to call also for myself that I am the voice of the South, um, that, that this particular film should be made and it should be made by me and by nobody else. And I should do the narration in German television. We only do voiceover. Uh, we don't do subtitles. That this narration should be my voice because my voice, my voice is me as well. And they wanted to take away my voice. So, I mean, it has been a long uh, um, uphill uh, struggle, but I've had a lot of colleagues who have also uh, been very supportive. And without that, and without the public uh, television, I wouldn't have been able to, to do what I have been, uh, what I have done. And um, um, and like all public, uh, public television, uh, it is normally, um, that is, that is the fate of what happens, uh, that it goes on to television and you have one rerun and then it disappears forever and ever into, into the vaults and, in, and disappears into the archives and gathers uh, uh, dust on the on the shelves, and uh, this has also always been my my uh, plea or or my my campaign uh, that we have to open up the archives for because for a great extent I was using archive material myself for the films, but this was due to a necessity and a contingency because. Uh, my television station didn't want to send me to India. They said, we have a correspondent there. So, you know, don't, don't go to Bangladesh. I mean, uh, you know, for all sorts of uh, reasons. Okay, I did go to, to Bangladesh, but every, everything was, uh, every, every um, um, film was, 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 was a struggle. Now, I'm not saying this is unique for me. Uh, Anybody in this business knows it's, it's highly uh, competitive, but it is also unique in the sense that at the time that I was really working, which was in the 60s and the 70s, 
I was really the the one person from from India. There were two others, um, uh, but they were working in a different um, um, uh, media. It was really something very rare. And in my station, I was the only one. So um, the 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 chance to bring in the uh, the the subjects that are uh, that that were at that statement still are very much um, very much part uh, part of me like uh, um, uh, uh, dealing with the um, colonialization with cultural imperialism uh, with against eurocentricism um, that I could do these uh, films and and by the sheer presence of myself, bring in the change, the shift of focus, so that you could open up, open up the way of seeing a thing. You could open up and contextualize it. It was hugely difficult, Volker. It was hugely difficult to do it because the complex, the issues in India are so so mm -hmm. complex. And if you want to get that, uh, uh, just yeah. alone, the Ayodhya story is so so complex. That and this also now in a foreign uh, language. I'm not a native German speaker, but um, for a German audience to put it into encapsulate it also into this time and the format, it it has been. Uh, it uh, let's say it wasn't without effort, but I mean that's why we're in the game. I'm I'm loved my job and um, when it was over there have been as in all uh, I was I I thought that it would be like the rest of the television um, journalists or filmmakers working for television that this is sick transit Gloria Mundi that's the way of the world it just goes by and there suddenly came Marla and there was this Superb, superb uh, um, archive, uh, the fifth wall, which is not only me, but it goes beyond me. So I can, I become a prototype and of that I'm very proud for something that I hope will follow, uh, can be followed up and uh, would become um, like uh, in, in Germany, there's a place where, where uh, writers, their manuscripts and all their works go to. It's a place called Marbach. There's one uh, um, sort of big archive there. And I hope that in this digital space, the fifth wall becomes a prototype for so many other uh, important uh, television works that one can do. And I think at this stage, I'm just quite exhausted, but I want more wanted to really um, express my deep gratitude to Melda for uh, for having had the patience for four years and for having developed this archive that has in a way immortalized me. Wow. <laughs> so it was my pleasure. Marina. And thank you all from 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 the my dearest friend uh, Deepa, whose, whose films I had the honor to uh, having also then uh, helped in having them shown in, uh, in German television, that I could then do the German uh, translation of it. So I became a part, part of it. And I, uh, yeah. um, I did those gladly. And, uh, and I'm also very thankful for the long friendship that we've had with you, Madhu, also. You started off at that, that uh, um, when I was working on the Kasauli art camp uh, on this feminist theater workshop. The only film where I could, uh, could have a performer's role is that film. Yeah. <laughs> I was immortalized in that film. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, there is so much to say, but so much, so much has been said already that, that I, um, I, I, I that I took a stand, let's say, I took a stand and I think it paid off in the end. I mean, the costs were high for me on various levels, but then 
Everybody's life has that kind of thing. The breaks are there. And I'm so glad. And just one more thing I'll tell you. Uh, Mala has been chasing me and pestering me for, for many, many years that she wanted to do a film portrait on me. And I've always resisted that. And I'm glad I did because a film portrait would never have had the enormous uh, uh, um, potentials and the, the, the scope uh, of uh, and and uh, uh, the scope of the fifth wall. So uh, I'm glad I resisted. And so she had to think up something new, and then she she did, and that she can. <laughs> She's also glad that you uh, resisted, so that she could come up with yet another way of uh, doing documentary culture, other than writing novel. Um, Navina. Your friends are sending love. Uh, Navro's contractor, Maya Krishna Rao, they have been uh, getting angry with uh, us for keeping you delayed. But you know, we had a plan, right? Um, thank you so much. It's so lovely to see you. And we all feel uh, Ram Rahman also is sending you a big hug and love. And I'm sure many others who are now quickly trying to uh, type uh, into the chat. You finished that. I just wanted to say for Navro's contractor, because I had the pleasure of, of doing film with him also, several, several films uh, mm -hmm. that we had done, sort of a couple of short ones, and the one on Amrita. So hi, Navro's. I'm glad you're there. So um, yeah, it has been wonderful, but it has come must come to an end. We have been on for two hours. It's quite late um, in the evening uh, for India. Thank you so much. So lovely to see you. More to your horsepower. Thank you. Oh. Thanks, all the panelists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madhushri. Um, good, Thank you. good evening. I'm Latika Gupta, and I work at the Sheer Gil Sundaram Arts Foundation as Director of Projects. On behalf of SSAF, I would like to express, first of all, a profuse thanks to Navina Sundaram. Navina, as you know, is founding trustee of the SSAF along with Vivan Sundaram. And the ethos for their path-breaking work forms the bedrock of the foundation's objectives and for all of the work that we do out here. Our gratitude to the panelists, Merle Kroger, Deepa Dhanraj, Sashi Kumar, Polka Pattenberg, for so readily agreeing to be a part of this program and for this engaging and remarkable discussion tonight. And of course, Madhushri Datta, for curating and moderating tonight's panel. This event, both the discussion tonight and the film screenings celebrate the Fifth Wall Archive. And we'd like to thank the curators, Merle, who's here, and Marika Bernier, Rubaika Jaliwal for the English translations of the films, along with Onir of Anticlock Films for the subtitles. The reports and films are available to watch on ssaf.in until the 31st of January. You saw just brief clips tonight. We would like to thank the Goethe Institute, Max Müller Bhavan, for supporting the program, as also the translations and the subtitling. Thanks also to Philip Schaffner of Bong Films Berlin. Before we end, I'd like to introduce our colleagues at SSAF. Um, if you could turn your videos on, please. Um, Guy Three, who you've met um, at the beginning, Associate, Associate Director Grants. Shaurabh Sheel, Archives Manager, who has designed the graphics and handled all the technical aspects for this event and the online film screenings. Malvika Madgulkar, Assistant Editor, Publications and Communications, who's worked on the communications for the program. And Santosh Sanyu, our Accounts Executive. And thank you all, um, the audience, for joining us this evening from different parts of the world and locations. And we hope to see you again and request you to check the website and follow us on social media for updates about upcoming programs. Thank you and good night.